at the very beginning of our time together, we, we do want to make it clear that we're here this morning, not as, not as experts in this area, but as flawed people who are trying to live out what we're talking about as a husband and wife and in church together and in our ministry context at college. Our main qualification to be up here is simply that both of us are lazy and complementarian. <laughs> but as brothers and sisters, we want to encourage you to embrace and embody the beautiful, satisfying, God-honoring, gospel-shaped life to which our God calls us. So today for us is all about commending a richly biblical, humble, soft-hearted, joy-filled, consistent complementarianism rather than a lazy one. We're very aware that living like this is a huge day-to-day dying to self and rising with Christ kind of thing. It's hard and we constantly mess up. Writing these talks collaboratively has been a challenge for us. (laughs) (laughs) Blending ideas, language, very different thought processes, Valuing the other, the different, it's not easy, but it's better, isn't it? It's essential if we're going to live out the conviction that we're better together. So we're also convinced that this good life that God holds out for all of us, men and women, married or single, leaders and followers, when we seek to live with him and for him in the power of his spirit, is in community with one another in the body of Christ. So whether you're here with us today as someone who shares this basic conviction that the gospel-driven life is a complementarian shape, uh, which takes into account the, the subtleties and nuances of the fact that we're created equal but different, or you're here as someone who may not be persuaded that this idea of complementarianism is actually biblical, but have just come along Uh, to listen sympathetically or even to satisfy yourself that you haven't made a huge mistake, we'd like to invite you to explore this sweep of biblical complementarianism with us. For some of us, the challenge will be to consider the ways in which we may not have been true to or followed through on what we say we believe, where we've been lazy complementarians. For others, We hope that what we present will just be thought-provoking and encouraging. Either way, it's our prayer that this morning it will be an honest experience, a thought-provoking softening and an energizing one as we seek to live together in ways that honor our Lord Jesus. So what is complementarianism? Uh, Several times over the past few months and this morning, Uh, On seeing this conference advertised or showing up, some friends have said, what exactly is lazy complementarianism? That's a really good question, but hopefully the answer will start to become obvious as we explain what we mean when we say complementarianism. Now, at one level, I realize this all may sound a little bit patronizing. You wouldn't be here if you hadn't thought uh, about complementarianism in some way and at least be interested in it. But I know that over the years, my own thinking has been a bit limited, short-sighted, and lazy in this area. Because I think at points it has escaped me that biblical complementarianism is actually a really big thing. It's made up of at least five aspects. And first of all, we'd like to step you through these five aspects. First, complementarianism is a theological conviction. To say that we're complementarian is to make a theological statement, a statement concerning what we believe God has revealed about what it means to be human and how we should relate to one another as men and women. You could summarize this conviction as God created all men and women with equal dignity and value, but has also assigned specific roles and ways of relating to some in the context of both the family and the church family. I reckon that's a minimal statement on which pretty much all complementarians would agree. Uh, Some would also argue that the created nature of men and women has substantial implications for how we function in every sphere of life. But for the sake of time today, we're going to focus on life and leadership in the local church. But before we start getting into details, we want to make sure that we're clear on the fact 
that complementarianism should never be a box ticking exercise. We don't ordain women. Tick, we're complementarian. We encourage men to make sure they're wearing the pants at home. Tick. Women don't preach in our church. Tick. You get the idea. The problem is that that kind of box ticking exercise is a long way short of the kind of richly biblical, humble, soft-hearted, joy-filled complementarianism that the Bible calls us to. See, that's not ticking just a few boxes. You know, like reassuring Qantas that we're not carrying any dangerous goods at check-in before we're allowed to get on the plane. It's a full and expansive commitment to a God-honoring life, which isn't just flung together from a few proof texts, but it's carefully constructed from at least four theological building blocks. Let me just point out what those are. The first building block of the idea of complementarianism is our theology of humanity. Complementarianism clearly has its roots in the towering statements of the opening chapters of the Bible, where God asserts at least five things. We're made in God's image, male and female which implies both some inherent likeness to God and ruling in God's place. The familiar words of Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Then God said, let's make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion. Verse 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. We're made in God's image. Then secondly, we are intricately related as men and women. In Genesis 2, verses 21 through to 23, where God creates woman out of man, the language emphasizes that we have the deepest possible connection as male and female. The word uh, rib is highly contested. The one thing that most commentators are sure of is that it doesn't mean rib. It, It means something right in the heart of man. And it's not saying that woman is created out of a spare bit. The very opposite, that the woman is created from the heart of man himself. The third thing then is even before the fall, the first couple are created to work together with he being designated a strong helper, that etzer word. The fourth thing, to state the obvious, only women can bear children which is quite obvious from Genesis 1, 2, and 3 and beyond. And then finally, the curse of Genesis 3 affects us differently as men now struggle to cultivate the earth and women struggle to bear the children to fill it in what is now a frustrating and complicated world. However, this is not all the Bible says about us as human beings. Biblical complementarianism doesn't just rely on Genesis 1 to 3, but needs to take into account the whole of Scripture, and in particular, to ensure that our biblical theology shapes our theology of humanity. Taking into account, for example, Paul's classic statement in Galatians 3. Now that faith has come, we're no longer under a guardian, for in Christ Jesus you're all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are now men and women in Christ. Our identity is not limited to who we are as created men and women. But now we are bound up inextricably with Christ, the true image of God himself. And we need to wrestle with that as we think about what it means to be men and women in Christ. So that's the first building block, our theology of humanity. Second one's fairly obvious, our theology of marriage. The idea that husbands and wives become one flesh Genesis 2, 24, and yet remain individuals who relate to one another in slightly different ways is clearly an important biblical idea, which is then picked up and developed in the New Testament, where, for example, the teaching of Ephesians 5 and 1 Peter 3 both describe how wives are called to respectful submission, whereas the husbands must show Christ-like, tender, protective, responsibility-bearing love. However, even as these slightly different expressions of mutual love are traced out, the apostles insist that husband and wife, like all believers, must submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. 
Peter rounds off his teaching in chapter 3 by saying, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brother of brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. So that's the second building block, our theology of marriage. The third one is our theology of leadership and authority. Passages, obviously, like 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, which deal with the appointment of the elders in the local church, are crucial, as are Paul's hotly disputed uh, comments in 1 Timothy 2, which Lionel is going to make utterly transparent in his elective this afternoon. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel and so on. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority for Adam was formed before Eve and so on. Now, that passage is very tricky, but it's also vital, as is Paul's discussion of headship in marriage in 1 Corinthians 11. But hard to interpret, though these passages may be, we can't ignore them because how we understand authority in the local church, in the family, and the link between authority and teaching takes us right to the heart of our life together. The fact that in church, some men who are above all godly are to bear responsibility for teaching and pastoring the church is clear. We've got to build that in. So we have our our theology of of human identity, our theology of marriage, our theology of leadership and authority. And there is a, a fourth building block. It's our theology of the body of Christ. Now, Whilst we do need to be willing to tackle the the thorny question of the role of elder only being open to some men, we've also got to make sure that we think seriously and live out the truth of 1 Corinthians 12, for example, which insists that it is our shared responsibility to build one another up in the gospel of the Lord Jesus. So 1 Corinthians 12, 12, just as the body is one and has many members and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we're all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. It's interesting, Paul doesn't even mention male or female here. For the body doesn't consist of one member but of many. And so it goes on to talk about the foot and the eye and so on. Biblical complementarianism insists that we are interdependent and we need each other. It's also exemplified in passages like Titus 2, which highlights how older and younger members of the family can serve one another. See, the New Testament doesn't just focus on difference and restriction but models a much broader commitment to seeing the body of Christ flourish in every part. And this fourth building block, the fact that we're mutually interdependent, that we need each other if we're to grow and flourish, is vital. Now, as we just run through those kind of key components, I hope you you can begin to see that the kind of complementarianism that, that... that the PA exists to encourage that we're talking about today is something that is deeply theological and richly biblical, but it is complex. And it must be marked, flavored with humility. Because we're dealing with difficult texts, dealing with difficult concepts. And we need to think hard about who we are as human beings, who we are as married couples where we're married, who we are as leaders and followers, and what it means to be the body of Christ, the local church. So complementarianism is at root a theological conviction. And that really matters because what we believe determines how we live. This rich and complex theological conviction requires us to act. In particular, it drives us to make an intentional commitment. This is the second aspect of complementarianism. The ordination service of the Presbyterian Church in Ireland, the denomination I grew up in and served in for 17 years as a pastor, contains these words. It is the privilege, right, and duty of every person to examine the scriptures and each individual is bound to submit to their authority. Then this, 
Having formed a definite conviction as to what the will of God is upon any subject, it is each person's duty to accept and obey it. I think that's a really helpful reminder. Not read the Bible, come to a conclusion and talk about it. Not even try to persuade other people of the conclusion you've come to. We're supposed to obey. And for us today, that means that having come to theological convictions about complementarianism, we have to commit ourselves to putting time and energy into working out those convictions in practice. Because it's one thing to say God created all men and women with equal dignity and value, and has also assigned specific roles and ways of relating to some in the context of both the family and church. But unless we're pursuing the goal of expressing that shared dignity and value and embodying what we believe the God-appointed shape of family life and church family life to be, then something has gone a bit wrong. It's the theological equivalent of saying that fitness is really important without ever actually getting out of your chair. To be complementarian entails an actual decisive physical commitment to work out this rich theology and practice. You know, sometimes it's good to have moments to look back on and say, at this point, I made a commitment, a promise before God and man to do this. Now, in most Bible teaching churches in Australia today, we're not really into special occasions or ceremonies or making a big deal out of particular moments. We generally prefer to get on with a steady rhythm of teaching the Bible and running growth groups and so on. But we do need to remember that as human beings, people like us sometimes do need to make those kind of commitments to say, from now on, this is how we're going to do things. Like Joshua on the edge of the land. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Or Peter in Acts 4. You can make up your minds whether you're going to listen to men, but I'm going to keep speaking about Jesus. See, if we're convinced that complementarianism, this rich complementarianism is biblical, then it actually calls for a kind of get off the sofa statement of intent. We need to decisively commit to working out these principles in every part of the life of the church. Which is why after our theological commitment and an intentional desire to act on it comes the third thing. And the third thing is an ongoing thoughtfulness. So if we're persuaded that fitness is important, then actually standing up as a declaration of intent is a key step. But it then has to be backed up by action, by an actual exercise program, doesn't it? In the same way, our theological commitment about complementarianism should drive us to a declaration of intent, which then needs to be worked out. And that takes ongoing thoughtfulness. Those of us who are in leadership need to express our complementarianism by continuing to think carefully and lovingly about how to embody the God-given patterns of life and ministry which we find in the Bible in ways that make sense in our changing context. And our content text is changing pretty rapidly, isn't it? That means we need to be thoughtful to keep up. For better or worse, we can't simply keep doing what we did 20 or even 10 years ago and expect it to be fit for purpose, embodying the richness of our theology today. We only need to think about how things have changed in the past 10 years. No one had heard of Me Too movement or toxic masculinity 10 years ago when we arrived in Australia. Then, among male students um, going into ministry, the biggest fear for them seemed to be that they couldn't be a church planter because their personality profile was not that of an alpha male. (laughs) Today... Their fear is that they might be accused of workplace bullying, or worse. There's a switch. In this quickly shifting cultural landscape, we have to make sure that we keep thinking sensitively and biblically as the challenges we face shift and change. In his article, Complementarity and the Scandal of Father Rule, Reformed theologian Kevin DeYoung writes, we are told that dismantling patriarchy is one of the chief concerns of our time. The deliberate move in our society to undermine male leadership will put complementarianism in the firing line from a number of angles. 
Brian Stout, who's the Dean of School of Social Sciences and the Provost at the University of Western Sydney, highlights ways in which our culture is smashing patriarchal pillars. He argues, one, we are transcending the gender binary. He says that we're smashing the patriarchy's artificial separation of human qualities into the rigid binary of masculine and feminine associated with men and women respectively. And the mantra that goes along with this is, only through the abolition of gender can we achieve true liberation. Does that resonate? Secondly, he says, women are speaking up. We know that. He says that we're smashing the patriarchal denial of women's capacity for strong, autonomous self. The mantra here, you are enough, you are, as you are, right now, you are perfect. Third, men are reaching out and reconnecting, smashing the patriarchal denial of men's capacity for relational connection. And the pathway to this is to reject masculine norms, recognize that we have been gaslit by a society that tells us that we as men don't need help, and going to therapy, joining men's groups. Fourthly, we are learning to heal and repair, smashing the patriarchy's message that enjoins man to separate his mind from his emotions and women to remain silent. The pathway to this is restorative and transformative justice, memorials and reparation. Fifthly, we are reconnecting with our bodies, smashing the patriarchal disconnection from our own bodies and our lack of attunement to what we're feeling emotionally and physically. The pathway towards this, claiming the right to feel what we feel and not be shamed for it, paying attention to what our bodies are telling us, owning our wanting and not being afraid to claim it sexually. And lastly, we are recognizing our interdependence. Smashing the patriarchal ideology that humans are individuals and exist in relationship to others in the world through competition, hierarchy, domination, and control. This mantra creates an us without a them. Only then, says Stout, will we be able to recognize our essential interdependence. This cultural movement will vilify complementarian Christians in our insistence on gender difference, on our attitudes to self and sex and the body, and ultimately in our belief that true freedom is found as we come to Jesus and submit to who he says we are rather than to the autonomy of self. And some of these tenets of our cultural thinking will seem so attractive and overlap with what we believe as Christians. And they will lull many of our churches into aligning themselves with what appear to be helpful values that do promote positive emotional intelligence and respectful interaction with one another. So we need to keep thinking carefully about what we're doing. This is essentially a call to ongoing thoughtfulness as we look out at the complexities of our world and also as we look at what we're doing inside the church. Uh, let me give you an example of where I just wasn't thinking at all. College Chapel at QTC takes place every Tuesday morning. Last semester, some of the women started asking some awkward questions. Um, awkward for the principal at least. What's the policy on who leads chapel? That was an awkward question because there wasn't actually a policy at all, and certainly not a well thought out theologically nuanced one. It was just an accidental practice. When we arrived at the start of 2012, someone told me that the Presbyterian ministry candidates normally led chapel. As I was busy trying to get my head around what a college principal actually does, who led chapel wasn't really a top priority. So I applied the profoundly theological principle, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, and forgot all about it. A few years after that, 
it dawned on us, well, there are quite a few people training to be pastors in churches who are not Presbyterian. Let's just throw it open to them. And after that, a couple of years later, I think there were a couple of gaps on the roster and a random few other blokes were asked. Women regularly prayed and read the Bible, but only male students were asked to lead. More accident than policy and not exactly thoughtful. So what did we do in what was potentially quite a divisive situation? Well, it actually took up about a week of my time trying to think through this, talk to people, think through the consequences, the theological differences in the college and the wider community. And so at the end, the principal made the call that Chapa would actually be led each week by one of the full-time lecturers, who weren't even all entirely in agreement on this, who are currently all male, supported by a mix of male and female students every week. Fell to me to try to balance the fact that, that we believe that the pastoral oversight of the college is in the hands of the principal and the faculty, by some loose analogy, a little bit like kind of minister and elders in our tradition. But also we desperately want to encourage female and male students to play a full part in the life of, of college and in chapel in particular, whilst ensuring that both the students with radically different views on this and their pastors behind them felt respected. Now, whether or not we made the right call, you know, leave it up to you to decide. It's not a law of the Medes and the Persians. But we were only pushed into thinking about this because some of the female students really helpfully asked us to be clear and thoughtful about what we were doing. And for that, I'm deeply grateful. Now, in a way, this is really just an expression of the principle semper reformanda. The work of seeking constantly to shape and reshape what we believe and how we live together in the light of God's revealed word. But it's a particularly important one, especially at this moment in the history of the church and our culture. Right now, we need to gently, humbly and confidently work out what we believe. We will not get away with being doggedly traditionalist. We need to be carefully biblical. For we are going to come under pressure for much of what we say and do. And we need to make sure that we're demonstrably a community that is modeling itself on God's concerns and agendas and commands. Because we believe that is not only right, but deeply attractive. So we need ongoing thoughtfulness. To be a complementarian is to make a commitment to work this through. And then to think relentlessly about how to encourage men to be godly, to encourage women to be godly, to think how we can serve together appropriately in every part of the church family as men and women in a way which commands and displays God's good purposes for us, his people. And if we're going to manage that well, we will need to be people who are marked by a fourth thing. And that's a relational sensitivity. This is the fourth part of the kind of complementarianism that we're talking about. Because complementarianism isn't just a theological grid that can be slapped over human relationships to help us navigate interaction on the basis of gender. Relational sensitivity requires both knowledge of self and understanding of the other. And that takes time and patience. It allows for the unique personality of the individuals who are interacting and it does not flatten the gender difference described biblically as very good into blue and pink, initiator and responder, physically strong and emotionally intelligent along gender lines. The glorious complexity of being fearfully and wonderfully made in God's image is instead celebrated in the desire to know and understand self and the other within the gender delineation that God has so graciously assigned us. However, relational sensitivity also necessitates that biblical difference is honoured and that gender difference in our sinful humanity is acknowledged. That both in our thinking and behaviour, we do allow for gender differences to be a key factor in our interactions with others. As followers of Jesus, we recognise that our battle against sexism, the wrongful treatment of another based on that person's sex or gender, will remain until his return to make all things new. 
So we cry out to God to move by his spirit to give us a humble awareness of our gendered sin and a gospel commitment to living out the undoing of the curse in Genesis 3, which pits male against female in its perpetual struggle for control and warps our longings and desires and destroys the synergy of the interdependence for which God made us. There is one more feature of this complementarianism, and we describe it as joyful, unashamed embodiment. The life to which God has drawn us in Christ and called us to live out is real life. It's life to the full. It's, it's a good and beautiful life. You see, to be a complementarian is actually a commitment, I think, to enjoy a gospel-shaped life to celebrate the life God has given us together, to commend it, to actually believe that the life God calls us to is the best life there is. There is A life of cooperation and freedom and interdependence and satisfaction. As Kevin DeYoung puts it, we need to help people see that our exegetical conclusions don't just fit with the best hermeneutical principles, They fit with the way the world is and announce the fact that God has made men and women and it is very good. Now, I suspect that the past 20 years or so has taken some of the joy out of our complementarian sales. I do wonder if you recognize yourself when you see an awkwardly embarrassed complementarian who believes it but just wishes it weren't actually true. Or the secretly reluctant or brazenly reluctant complementarian, who again is essentially convinced, but really wants to make sure that it affects church life in an absolutely minimal way. Or have you ever met or been a subversively superior complementarian? Yes, I am a complementarian. I'm just not like all those other awful complementarians <laughs> out there. You see, we're called to be quietly convinced, determined, thoughtfully happy complementarians because the gospel shaped life is a genuinely good life. And that's what we're called to. So when we talk about complementarianism, this is what we're talking about. It's a richly biblical, humble, soft-hearted, thoughtful, and joy-filled thing. It can't be reduced to a couple of proof texts, a short list of things that only men should do. Hallelujah. It's a carefully developed theological conviction, which produces a highly intentional commitment to work out how we, as men and women, should serve God together leading us to ongoing thoughtful reflection, examining our own prejudices and assumptions and those of our world, with the goal of convincing every single person in our church family of the beauty of God's pattern of our shared life and presenting and celebrating a healthy demonstration of God's way to a watching world, a world in which we are increasingly the bad guys, where we can expect government legislation to clash with our convictions. That's what we think we should be aiming for because this is the kind of complementarianism that God calls us to. Now, at this point, we were going to get you to discuss something, um, but that that shameful performance earlier on when Simon let you off the leash for a second has has made us uh, a little bit reluctant about that. We do want to have morning tea. Uh, so just for a second, as, as, we, as we've done that, as we've gone through these, these five aspects that are, that are on the outline, whether it's our theological conviction or our commitment or our thoughtfulness or our relational sensitivity or the last one, that joyful, unashamed embodiment, just as we hear those, Which do you think is the most challenging or resonates most quickly with you as we seek to live out what it means to be complementarian? For the next few minutes, we just want to step through those things as we answer the question and hopefully justify the title of today, is lazy complementarianism a thing? So we think it is a thing, 
Because if complementarianism is a theological conviction which flows into a commitment and an ongoing project of change and celebration, then we think if we're not very careful, we can all slip into some form of lazy complementarianism. So what might that look like? Well, here are the five marks of lazy complementarianism. (laughs) The first is shoddy theology. You see, if we're not actually convinced that complementarianism is a full-orbed, rich and positive conviction which impacts much of life, there are a whole host of ways in which we'll fail to do it justice and of which we need to repent. So is it possible that we need to repent of quarantining complementarian theology to specific areas of church life? So thinking it really is just about leadership within our particular tradition. It's really just about ordination. Or perhaps we need to repent of ignoring aspects of complementarian theology to make life easier for us. I suspect that's what I've been guilty of. Simon and I were swapping texts this morning, and at one stage Simon Simon texted me to say, yep, that that is complementarianism. It's messy, but it's generally better at the end. And I think that's true. Life is more complicated if you're complementarian. You know, for us, I mean, Fiona said, it's actually really hard working together to do something. These talks would have been much easier for us to do our own thing on on our own. Except if I'd let Fiona do that, it would have been better. If you'd been left to me on my own, who knows what would have happened. There's a cost in it, but the cost is worth it because it's better. And that's played out across all of church life. We may need to repent of reshaping or reducing complementarian theology to make life more comfortable for us in the ministry context we're in. We may need to repent of exploiting complementarian theology to suit our personalities or baptize our preferences or cement our power. We may need to repent of apologizing for complementarian theology. Those are all just bad theological steps to take. And it may be as we looked at the theological building blocks earlier, even that quick step through may have been enough to expose some areas that we simply have not thought about as we've wrestled with the reality of living together as men and women in church. So are we guilty of shoddy theology? A couple of questions to mull over. Has the church or ministry you're part of taken time to articulate your theological position. And I don't just mean what women can and can't do. What you actually believe about the Bible's teaching in this area. And the second question, that well, even if you have taken that step, do you work hard to ensure that it shapes practice in every part of of your church family life. In one of our local churches in Brisbane just now, that's just done that. Um, Their women's worker who was a student with us took time and wrote a paper and the church adopted it. Um, And then the church didn't actually have the money to employ her anymore. So she came off the staff team and there's no female voice on their staff team. And the danger is that these theological convictions remain aspirational. I think we need to be really honest about having done the hard theological work, but not then saying, okay, we no longer have a woman on staff. How are we going to do this with volunteers? How are we actually going to make that work now that this person who's done this work, who's convinced us of the need for this, has gone? So a second one then, after shoddy theology, is winning commitment. This isn't a matter of rejecting complementarianism, but just quietly deciding it isn't a priority anymore. Almost like we fought this battle and won. We've decided our position. More than a tick box, a settled commitment, 
but no development of that and a, a lack of commitment to that moving forward. And really now concentrating on other things that seem more urgent in our church's life. So it's a case of benign neglect. And if this is us, then some helpful questions in this area might be, when was the last time you raised or discussed complementarianism as a key component of your church or ministry? In the last time that you organized anything for men, for women separately or together as a team, was your complementarity a key feature of how the day was shaped? Was it front and center? Or have you asked women what their experience of church life is and reflected on how that fits with complementarianism? What's their lived experience of your policy, of your stated theological view, of your intentions, even of the things that you've put into action? Has this actually made a difference? Are women feeling valued? And have you ever asked your children and young people in church to articulate what they think your church believes in this area? Because their views are formed differently on the basis of what they see, on the basis of how people in leadership treat them and interact. And you get very different responses and often more honest responses when you ask children and young people. And these are the people whose lives and theology are being formed. Have we asked our children and young people what they think? Then number three in this area is tired thinking. It is easy to keep on doing what we've always done without really thinking about it. Certainly without thinking positively about how we could model a healthy complementarianism. Um, I think a helpful example in this space is where one of our local churches had thought really hard and wanted to write in the women's conference uh, this sense that a woman's place is in the kitchen. And so they got the men to serve in the kitchen and the men to do the childcare. And there was this beautiful... Um, working together at the annual teaching day. The, the staff team were delighted. The organizing team were delighted. They thought it, it, the men in the church were, that helped were delighted. They thought this was great. However, on the feedback forms from the women that had come to the conference, the story was quite different. And I think this is a massive case of message given and message received and how our theology is actually impacting church family life. Okay, first, the day had been a little bit chaotic. It was a women's tech team. The speaker had had a video and there was no sound and none of the women knew what to do about it. <laughs> the men that could have helped were actually looking after the children or in the tea, burning themselves as they tried to heat the scones. <laughs> it was an all-female band and the drummer was really anxious and nervous and the keyboard player wasn't great. And women complained about the music. And thirdly, there are four things. Thirdly, um, there was a seminar on what, let me get the, the title correct, is yeah, what men hear when you criticize them. A really helpful thing for women to consider. But the feedback was, we would really like to have heard from men. <laughs> Which kind of makes sense. <laughs> And last thing, some of the women actually felt uncomfortable about leaving their small children and babies with men in childcare. And th that had been an awkward thing. So what we had was the team, the organizing team, the staff leadership, all planning this beautifully and wanting to display something amazing about our complementarity, and it kind of backfired. But let's praise God for the humility of the people involved in that. Because the next year, they had a dad and kids day out at the same time as the women's teaching day. So the dads and kids did stuff together, and some extra men came and helped to play with kids whose dads couldn't be there. But that was an easy, safe environment that everyone was happy with. And they actually just involved men. They worked together. So it's easy to think that we're fixing things, that we're actually setting a really positive model for church life, but the messages received are not the same thing. And we need the whole body to tell us what's going on, rather than just us work this out in our heads, think that we're doing a great job, and people not actually appreciating our complementarity, not rejoicing in it, but actually struggling with it. 
Just as a side note, there were a couple of women the next year when all this had been fixed that actually complained and said it was really hard having men there at all. That wasn't their expectation. And that upset and undermined the day for them. And I think what that does is just show us that everybody isn't always going to be satisfied or happy or okay with that. And we do have a responsibility to protect the most vulnerable in our community. And those women were among them. And so there was another shift and another rethink that had to take place. This is a working process, isn't it? So when we, when we think about our policies, are we actually revitalizing them? Are we, are we listening? Are we changing? Are we constantly refining? Or have we said fit for purpose 10 years ago and we just keep going because it seemed to be working? The fourth mark of lazy complementarianism, and certainly the most uncomfortable so far, um, is relational insensitivity, which is often born out of a lack of understanding or appreciation of the differences between men and women, and especially the ownership of our typical sinful behaviors. Now, we have to be careful here. I mean, they, these things are not ultimate or prescriptive, but there are general desires that seem to be gender specific. There are ways of behaving which contribute to the complexity of complementarian interaction. The same root sin tends to have different expression in the lives of the sons of Adam and the daughters of Eve. So in the struggle for power, men tend to wage war using things like physical dominance. Even, even those of us who are not particularly tall or physically imposing can do this without thinking about it. We can do it when we talk, talking over women, interrupting women, ignoring women in meetings, adopting a, a high tone or, or a slightly aggressive tone. Sometimes we can do it with body language, kind of towering over women, filling the space, taking the best position in the room, physically blocking or excluding women from conversations. Sometimes we can even do it with physical gestures, you know, fist pumps, high fives, the crushing handshake, the, the unwanted pre-COVID hug, the slightly uncertain post-COVID hug. <laughs> But all of those physical things can create fear and distance and disconnection and distrust and isolation in women. But some of us wouldn't be so crass as to exercise physical dominance. We, we do intellectual and theological dominance. We speak in patronizing tones to women. Sometimes men are slow to initiate theological conversations with women. Shut women down when they have theological questions. Use theological vocabulary in a way that's designed to exclude. Sometimes using gender-based condescension to mask insecurity or ignorance. And all that can leave women feeling stupid or angry or bullied or intimidated. And then sometimes men give themselves license to be emotionally crass. General insensitivity, crushing women with harsh comments, with an, I'm only joking, of course, appended, trivializing extremely serious matters with jokey remarks, at which point I'm just thanking God that my daughters aren't in the room. You know? It's very easy for men to do this. It's a way of coping, but it's ultimately selfish. It can wound and distress women. It devalues and, sh and shuts women down. It discourages interaction. And the problem with all this is that we tend to do it without even thinking about it. And in the struggle for power, women tend to claim a sphere of influence and shut men out. Our need to prove our unique worth, often in areas of perhaps counselling, pastoral care, 
women's ministry, children's ministry, can leave men feeling impotent or hurt, or free to negate any responsibility and leave women to plot their own course. A feeling, a wrong feeling, that we have been deprived of power can actually cause us to grab it in any area that seems available and to shut men out. And another uh, manifestation of uh, this power struggle in female sin can be to manipulate. There's emotional manipulation, both in the personal realm, you don't understand me or the hurt you're causing, and in relation to the church family, where we claim a greater emotional intelligence or exert influence on the basis of understanding and responding to the feelings of others. There can be emotional manipulation, but also relational manipulation, where a woman can use her status as a wife of an elder or a pastor to attempt to influence their husband or the shape of a ministry in church life, or use this status to give them relational power over others that are less connected in church. Any of us can use relational closeness to others in the church family to get information, pass on confidential information, to gain power or sway decisions, to use blanket statements that attack, to attack a man in a gender-specific way. People are scared to tell you. And then in relational manipulation, there can also be a tendency to mother men condescendingly, treating them like babies. And then there can be physical and verbal manipulation, from playing dumb to flirting to tears and tantrums and flattery and obsequious hero worship to mockery and belittling men. So none of these behaviours from men or women is consistent with the kind of complementarianism to which God calls us. And we need to be sensitive to all of this and to take the plank out of our own eye before we take the speck out of the eye of the other. I reckon that we're all really good at spotting these propensities in the opposite gender. We might even recognise them in some of our own gender but it is hard to admit that they may be lurking in our own hearts and behaviours. Um, the last one is we, we can be guilty of miserable negativity. Uh, some of us are a bit like Puddleglum in C.S. Lewis's Silver Chair. You know, he lived by the principle that no situation was so bad that it couldn't get worse. And some of us wear our complementarianism with all the joy of someone about to be hung, drawn, and quartered. <laughs> then for some of us, we're more politically savvy, but we're a bit slippery. You know, they were complementarian. It enables us to be part of the tribe, but we're just not going to get too passionate about it. Then, of course, there are some of us who can become proselytizers and elevate complementarianism to part of the gospel itself and really the ultimate test of orthodoxy. But none of these things are routinely celebrating and championing the beauty of God's good design. And we may need to think about that. So very briefly, as we go to morning tea then, what leads to lazy complementarianism? Okay. How, do we, how do we get here? Well, we just want to leave you with this. It's very easy for all of us to slip into lazy complementarianism. See, we can be strongly theologically driven and be lazy complementarians. We can be radically missionally focused and be lazy complementarians. We can all do it, basically, because it's hard living this out. So how can it happen? It can happen when we assume that our existing practice is flawless. It can happen when we assume that we sorted this issue out years ago and there's nothing more to say. It can happen when we're basically driven by the need to get stuff done. It can happen when we're pragmatically rather than theologically motivated. It can happen when we compartmentalize. It can happen when we're driven by minimizing complaints in the church family. It can happen when we forget about our need to articulate and model our theology. It can happen when we're driven to responding to the loudest voices in the room. 
So what are we to do? Acknowledge our weakness, recognize, recognize the goodness of God's provisions, repent of our laziness, our sinful choices, our lack of consistency, and ask God to show us where to go from here to which we'll turn after morning tea.